Hey, Ape Scholars, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we're gonna to be going over all the types of math that you need to be able to do in the Apes exam. So if you're ready to think like a mountain and calculate like a scholar, let's get started. And before we go any further, you'll wanna make sure that you have your ultimate review packet math review printed out so that you're ready to follow along as we go through some of these practice problems together. But before we get into the different types of math problems or the different calculations you'll be asked to do in the Apes exam, let's just set the overall context here and review what proportion of the entire exam will be made up of math-based questions. According to the APES course and exam description, you can expect six to 9% of the multiple choice questions and 20% of the FRQ questions to be calculation-based. And since the multiple choice portion of the exam is worth 60% of your overall score and the FRQ portion is worth 40%, that means that altogether, math-based questions will make up about 12 to 13% of your final score. Now, the good news is that with the tips and tricks in this video, you are gonna to be totally prepared for any type of calculation-based question that you see, which will help you maximize the points you earn there and earn that passing exam score. And since there's 80 multiple choice questions and six to 9% of those questions will be calculation-based, you can expect to see roughly five to seven calculation-based questions on the multiple choice portion of the APES exam. Now in the FRQ section, we have a little bit more clarity. As stated in the CED and confirmed by the 2021 released FRQ sets, the math questions will appear on the third FRQ and should take the form of three different two point questions. Each of these questions will have one point for the correct setup with units and one point for the correct answer with units. And this brings us to FRQ tip number one, which is you must include units. That's right, in both your setup and your answer, you have to include units if you want any chance of earning those points. Take it from someone who's graded exams for the college board in May, the number of points I've had to take away from ape scholars that have otherwise correct setup and answers, but forgot their units truly pains me. Now, FRQ math tip number two is to memorize the percent change formula. There were percent change questions on both of the released 2021 FRQ sets, and there have been percent change questions on both the FRQ and multiple choice questions of the official practice exams released by the College Board. So it's a pretty safe bet that you're gonna to have to do percent change calculations at some point on this year's exam. Now, the way I like to help my students remember the percent change formula is new times 100. So the N in new stands for the new value. The O in new stands for the old value. And then of course, you have to multiply by 100 to turn this into a percent. But if we look a little closer here, we're gonna make sure that we need to use parentheses to separate new minus old, and then we need that quantity all over old, and then we need to multiply that quantity by 100. And since percent change problems always give you a starting number and an ending number, you just have to remember that the starting number is the old number, and the ending number or the more recent number is the new number. So let's take a look at an example using renewable energy. If we look at this practice problem here, it says from 2005 to 2018, the annual investment in renewable energy sources in the United States increased from $11.4 billion to $46.5 billion. And we need to calculate the percent change in renewable energy investment in the US from 2005 to 2018. So step one here is to identify our new value and our old value. Our new value is $46.5 billion since it's from 2018, which is more recent or the newest time. And our old value is $11.4 billion since it was our starting value or the one from longer ago. Now that we have these values determined, we're just plugging these into the percent change formula. So we need $46.5 billion minus $11.4 billion all over $11.4 billion times 100. And as long as you clearly separate these values with parentheses, you can enter this into your calculator all at once. Now, if this makes you nervous or you don't wanna waste time finding the parentheses key on your calculator, you can just make sure that you perform each step and hit enter before proceeding to the next step. So 46.5 minus 11.4 is 35.1, divided by 11.4 is 3.0789, and then we multiply by 100 to end up with 307.89%. Now on the FRQ scoring guides from the 2021 exam, answers rounded to the nearest tenth of a percent or whole percent were accepted. So I would expect an official scoring guide for this question to accept both 308% as well as 307.9%. Now it's impossible to tell exactly what the questions that you see on this year's exam will look like in terms of the tenths or hundredths place and their rounding. So my best advice to you is to keep all the value stored in your calculator. And then at the end, you can round to either the tenths place or the whole percent place if you're doing a percent change question. In addition to being able to calculate percent change, it's really important that you're comfortable working with percentages in general. And that's tip number three for the math-based section of the APES FRQs. And the most important thing that you remember when working with percentages is that percent literally means per 100. So if you're given a percentage and you need to convert it into a decimal in order to use it in a calculation or a conversion, you can just divide that percentage by 100 
or move the decimal point two places to the left. And the other thing you may be asked to do is to calculate a percentage of a percentage. So we'll take a look at how to turn percentages into decimals to use them in calculations and how to take a percentage of a percentage in this following practice question. So in this practice problem, we're told that the total global greenhouse gas emissions are equivalent to 51 billion tons of CO2 and that 19% of these 51 billion tons come from agriculture. But then within that 19% of agricultural emissions, over 80% comes from methane and nitrous oxide. And we're asked to calculate the total equivalent tons of CO2 that these methane and nitrous oxide emissions represent. So there are two basic steps here. First, we need to figure out the tons of greenhouse gases released by agriculture, or take 19% of 51 billion, and then take 80% of that 19%. So for step one, we need to convert 19% into a decimal. So we just divide that by 100 or move the decimal place two places to the left, which gives us 0.19. Then we need to multiply that number by 51 billion since we wanna find 19% of that 51 billion. And that gives us 9.69 billion tons, which is the total greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. For step two, we'll need to calculate 80% of these 9.69 billion tons since 80% of all agricultural emissions come from methane and nitrous oxide. So again, we'll start by converting 80% into a decimal, which gives us 0.8, and then we'll multiply 0.8 by 9.69 billion tons to arrive at a final answer of 7.7520 billion tons. Now remember, FRQ scoring guides typically round to the tenths place, so I would expect a scoring guide to accept either 7.7 .7 or 7.8 billion tons of CO2. Now along with percent change and working with percentages more generally, a type of problem that you almost certainly see on the APES exam this year will be unit conversion. Now this could come in the form of a story problem on the FRQ section, but it could also be a simple multiple choice question that's gonna ask you to convert from one unit to another. Now if you have really solid story problem skills as it is, and you can parse out the steps and just write them down, as long as you include units, that's totally fine in terms of showing your work. I've even seen students write it out in sentence form so long as they show each step with units. If you prefer dimensional analysis or if you want a safer method that can help make sure you're converting from the units that are given to the units that you need in your answer, we're gonna go through that process now. In dimensional analysis, you'll start out with a value or a ratio that's specified for you in the problem and then you'll go through progressive steps of unit conversion until you arrive at the units that your answer needs to be in. Now, what I like about this method is you cross off units as you go, and as long as you can remember one simple rule, it's really easy to make sure you go from your starting units to the units that your answer needs to be in. And that simple rule you need to remember is that to eliminate units, you need to have them on opposite sides of your division line. I'll explain what that means here with an example. So let's say we wanna convert 235 meters to kilometers using dimensional analysis. Now, the first thing we're gonna do is write the value 235 meters over one on the left-hand side of our paper. The reason I'm putting it over one is to remind myself that meters is on top of this ratio or this fraction in my starting value so that I make sure I put meters on the bottom in my conversion factor. Now, in this case, we have a really simple conversion factor, which is one kilometer being equal to a thousand meters. But again, writing 235 over that one is gonna remind me that in my conversion factor, I'm gonna put meters on the bottom. So essentially what we'll have is 235 meters over one, times one kilometer over 1,000 meters. This will allow us to cancel out meters and will leave us with kilometers. And if we carry this problem through, what we'll find is that 235 meters divided by 1,000 meters is equal to 0 0.235 kilometers. Now you might be thinking this is extremely basic, but people come to apes with all different math backgrounds. And I really wanna make sure we understand the basis of dimensional analysis and then we have that number one rule of dimensional analysis down before we dive into a much more complicated problem. Speaking of more complicated dimensional analysis problems, let's take a look at one now. So for the background of this question, Nestle is pumping 2,200,000 liters of groundwater per day from the aquifers in Michigan, and they're then selling 500 milliliter water bottles at an average price of 125, and we need to calculate the total weekly revenue that Nestle would earn from these water bottle sales. So remember, the first step here is to identify our starting units, which would be 2,200,000 liters per day. So we would write out 2,200,000 liters on top and one day on the bottom. And then since this is a multi-step problem, we're gonna go to the far right side and we're gonna write out the units that our answer needs to be in so that we remind ourselves that we need to convert this liters per day into dollars per week. And this step is really important so that you know when you're done with the unit conversion. Now all we have to do is keep plugging in conversion factors until we've made it from liters per day 
to dollars per week. So our next step is to convert liters to milliliters. Since liters is on the top in our initial ratio, I'm gonna put one liter on the bottom in our unit conversion factor and 1000 milliliters on the top. This allows us to cross off liters and we can see that we're now working with milliliters per day. Now our next step is to convert milliliters to bottles of water. And since milliliters is on the top of our previous conversion factor, we'll put 500 milliliters on the bottom of our next conversion factor and one bottle on top. Now that's gonna enable us to cross off milliliters. And so we can see that now we're working with bottles per day and we need to convert this into dollars per day. So we can put one bottle on the bottom of our next conversion factor and $1.25 on the top. And finally, since we need our answer to be in dollars per week, we'll convert from days to weeks by putting seven days on the top of our next conversion factor since it's way back on the bottom in our initial ratio and one week on the bottom of this final conversion factor. Now it's up to you how to actually plug this into your calculator. You can either multiply through everything on the top, multiply through everything on the bottom, and then divide the top by the bottom, or you can go through step by step, but just be careful that if you're multiplying through the entire top and the bottom, you keep those numbers separate. In this case, there's only one number on the bottom, so it's a little bit easier, but if we multiply through everything on the top and then divide by 500, we'll find that the weekly revenue is $38,500,000 per week. Now, just a quick word on the setup here. Some students may have learned what's called the railroad method of unit conversion, where you just draw one horizontal line and then you draw vertical lines separating each of your unit conversion factors and you know then to multiply through everything on the top, multiply everything through on the bottom and divide by each other. Whether or not you wanna use the railroad method, if you're comfortable with that, or if you just wanna keep these as all separate conversion factors with multiplication signs between them, either way works, but just remember to include units and just remember to be careful when entering these into your calculator. So just as a quick recap here, based on the 2021 released FRQs, the three most important types of math problems to be able to do are percent change, percentages in general, and unit conversion. For percent change, remember new times 100 or new minus old, all over old times 100. For percent, just remember that you need to divide by 100 to convert percentages into decimals to use in conversion. And then finally, to use dimensional analysis, remember that you need to place units on opposite sides of your division line in order to cross them off and arrive at your final units that are specified in the answer. Now that we've established the three major types of questions that you're most likely to see on the FRQs, we're gonna take a look at some more niche types of calculations that you might see on the multiple choice, or if the college board decides to throw a curveball at you on the FRQ section. Now, if you've already watched the unit one review video, then you've already seen this clip on calculating net primary productivity, but there are additional extra practice problems in the math section of the APES Ultimate Review Packet. So let's say we have a forest ecosystem that we know has a gross primary productivity of 1000 kilocalories, per meter squared per year. It has a respiration loss of 250 kilocalories per meter squared per year. We're just gonna plug these numbers into our formula and subtract 250 from 1000, and that's going to give us a net primary productivity of 750 kilocalories per meter squared per year. Another type of calculation that comes from unit one is calculating the energy availability or biomass availability at different trophic levels. The only thing you need to remember here is the rule of 10. This is just simply gonna be multiplying by 10 or dividing by 10, to find the level of energy or biomass at different trophic levels. So let's say you're given a trophic pyramid with 10,000 kilocalories of energy available at the producer level. To calculate the amount of energy available at each successive level, you simply divide the 10,000 kilocalories at the producer level by 10 or multiply by 0.1 since only 10% of the energy moves on. This would give us 1,000 kilocalories available at the primary consumer level, 100 kilocalories available at the secondary consumer level, and only 10 kilocalories available at the tertiary consumer level. Now let's say you're given available energy at a higher level than the primary producer level. Well, to move down the pyramid, you simply multiply by 10 to determine the available energy at a lower trophic level. And if you're asked a similar question, but with biomass instead of energy, you can use the same exact process. The next type of calculation you may run into in the exam is calculating human population growth rates with CBR and CDR or calculating the doubling time using the rule of 70. Now, if you've seen the unit three video, then you've already seen this segment, but I did throw in a few extra practice problems to help you freshen up. To figure out the percent growth rate of a country, we subtract CDR from CBR, and then divide that number by 10, because crude birth rate and death rates are per 1,000, and we want a percent, which means per 100. So let's try a practice problem here quickly. Pause the video and see if you can find the percent growth rate of the global population using the global CBR and CDR data from 2019. All right, let's see how you did. We're just gonna plug these numbers into the formula. And so that means we'll subtract 7.52 or the CDR from 17.89 or the CBR 
and that gives us a difference of 10.37. Then we'll divide that number by 10 to convert it into a percent, and that gives us a global population growth rate of 1.037%. Another type of calculation we need to do with populations is to determine the doubling time. Now there's a fun little apes trick for this called the rule of 70, and all it requires is that you divide 70 by the growth rate as a percent of the population. So if we wanted to figure out how many years it will take for the Earth's human population to double, we would just divide 70 by 1.037, and we'd find that it should take about 67.5 years. The next type of calculation isn't so much a type of calculation, as much as it is a reminder about a special type of units called kilowatt hours. See, the main way that we measure electricity consumption is in kilowatt hours, which is actually a compound unit. Now to understand what this means, it's helpful to remember that energy is actually a measure of power applied over time. And so in this unit, we have watts, which is power, times time, hours, to give us kilowatt hours. So one kilowatt hour would be equal to 1000 watts used over a period of one hour. Two types of questions that may involve kilowatt hours could be calculating savings based on using fewer kilowatt hours by using a more efficient device or determining the amount of energy used by a certain device based on the number of watts it requires and the amount of time it's operated. For an example of this first type of problem, let's say that we install a new high efficiency water heater that uses 50 fewer kilowatt hours per month and that electricity costs 12.2 cents per kilowatt hour. So first we'll write out 50 kilowatt hours over one and then we'll multiply that by the conversion factor of 12.2 cents over one kilowatt hour. Remember we need to put kilowatt hours on the bottom so that we can get rid of those units. This is gonna lead us to multiplying 50 by 12.2, which gives us an answer of 610 cents or $6.10. And if this seems really basic, again, I'm glad that means you had awesome math teachers, but people come to apes in all four different grade levels in high school with all different math backgrounds. And I wanna make sure we're all prepared for that exam in May. Now for the second type of problem, you may be given the wattage of a device and the duration of time that it's used for and asked to calculate how many kilowatt hours of electricity it would consume. If that's the case, first convert your given watts to kilowatts by multiplying by one kilowatt over 1000 watts, which is the same thing as dividing by 1000 if you prefer to think of it that way and then multiply that kilowatt value by time to arrive at an answer of kilowatt hours. Another energy-based type of math question you might see on the APES exam is calculating the half-life of a radioactive element. Remember that radioactive elements are decaying over time and actually losing mass. So the half-life is the amount of time measured in years that it takes for half of the initial mass of that radioactive element to decay. So let's look at a practice problem using the example of uranium-235, which is the isotope most commonly used for nuclear energy generation. It has a half-life of 704 million years. So in other words, 704 million years from now, a spent fuel rod will still emit half as much radiation as it does today. So let's say we wanna figure out how much a 100 gram mass of uranium-235 would be left in 2 billion 112 million years. Now this might sound like an oddly specific number, and that's because it is. If we divide 2 billion 112 million by 704 million, we'll see that this represents three half-lives worth of time. And so we would divide our initial mass in half once to get 50 grams, divide it in half again to get 25 grams, and in half one more time to get 12.5 grams. Now you may also be given the change in mass over a given period of time, the length of time, and asked to go backwards and calculate the half-life of that radioactive element. So let's say we have a 28 gram sample of plutonium-241, and after 42 years, it now has a mass of 3.5 grams. We could find its half-life by determining how many times that initial sample was cut in half, and then dividing that number by 42 years, since that's how long it took for this decay to occur. So if we divide 28 grams in half once, we get 14 grams, then a second time, we get seven grams, and then a third time and we get 3.5 grams. That tells us that there were three half-lives that occurred over these 42 years. So if we divide 42 by three, that gives us one half-life equal to 14 years. And just like all the other types of questions we reviewed in this video, there's extra half-life questions for you to practice in the APES Ultimate Review Packet. All right, APES scholars, hopefully after this video, you're feeling much more confident about the math portion of the APES exam. Remember that on the FRQ section, you'll see six total points, and that will be three questions on FRQ number three, each question will be worth two points, one for the correct setup with units, one for the correct answer with units. And remember that there will also likely be somewhere between five and seven multiple choice questions that require you to either do calculations or identify a setup that would calculate a correct answer for a given question. And if you remember nothing else from this video, remember new times 100. 
That's new minus old, all over old times 100. That's the percent change formula, and you're almost guaranteed to see percent change on the APES exam. As always, think like a mountain and calculate like a scholar.